Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on today. We are really excited to have the folks from QLab here. Sam Kuznets and uh, Chris, Ash Chris Ashworth will be here, and uh, they will be talking and answering your questions about the new QLab 5, and we're really excited about it. So, uh, so stay tuned for that and get your questions into Mukana early so that we know all the things that you want to know about the new QLab. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitch, what do we have? Thank you, Alex. Our first in from Ari Block in Tel Aviv, Israel. Is there a way to change the default system audio device on Windows or the Mac using Companion? I'll go ahead, Nigel. So I'm very scared of saying anything definitive, but I've tried five different things this morning and I can't seem to get to it. Um, the problem is that even on a Companion, there's no necessarily a system-based a connector, even if you use, try and use the Elgato software, um, you know, you, you can't, there's no hotkey, there's nothing. So I've not been able to do it. The way I have to do it is I actually listen to the X32 and I can control through Companion my X32 when I listen to it, but I can't seem to find my way to the system preferences. Go ahead, uh, John. All right, more of a question. Uh, can you run PowerShell commands from uh, Companion? If you can, on the Windows, you'd be able to do anything you, you'd want. You can manipulate the system from there. There you go. Uh, next question. Next in from Robert Shoji in Los Angeles, California. Why was the Brandy Carlisle IMAX event broadcast live as opposed to being recorded, edited, and played back as a world premiere? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, to generate notoriety and to make it more of an event, uh, kind of like the garbage truck that you're outside right now. Um, <laughs> sorry. You go, sorry. You got quite an event going on right now. Perfect. Time. Live from Courtney. Live. Garbage. There's the a band called Garbage. Yeah, Los exactly. Angeles Garbage Control. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. It's, uh, I think they wanted to use... Hold on a second. That made it a little bit better, but why don't you go to the Mitchell. To Mitchell and come back to me. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. All right. Um, I think it was an interesting um, uh, event uh, to be done live. I mean, personally, um, I would love to go to a digital first event in an IMAX theater with comfortable chairs and a lot less crowd uh, craziness and uh, an excellent view of what's going on on stage right there in front of me so I can see it with great sound uh, in a very controlled uh, environment. I, I, I hazard a guess that that was an experiment done to see how uh, competitive a digital first event like that, done so well, so well executed as a live event, which gives it that extra feeling of uh, visceral uh, 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 participation event, um, is something of the future. I think it is. I, I think that people, all things considered, would rather go to their neighborhood IMAX, watch that kind of event than going to a big uh, conference center and dealing with lots of people and uh, the vagarities of that. Yeah, and I think the, the live portion lets you do things like ask live questions and so on and so forth that are that are not something you can do if you record it. And I think that doesn't give you a little bit more of feeling like you're there. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and it was, uh, I think it was an experiment, like Mitch said. Uh, they wanted to gauge their audience. And if you just drop uh, a new music video when they drop the album, you don't really have that much of a, a metric on how many people are seeing it or how many people are you know attending it. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's a concert, public concert, I think they get a much better gauge by ticket sales to the actual in in theater event because that way they know there's you know seven people sitting in front of that television mm -hmm. set or just one person sitting in front of it. But uh, good. go ahead, Alex. Go ahead, Mitchell. <laughs> yeah, the the interesting thing is that you have to remember that the way the music industry works now is that most of the money that an artist can make is from touring. Uh, that's where most of the uh, uh, their income comes from. So I think if you follow the money, you'll find that doing a digital first event gets gets you out to more people in different places all over the world, um, and there's no touring cost per se. It's just a one time uh, setup and uh, and presentation. So I think that uh, I think that's part of it, um, and I think that the uh, the trend is more towards these kind of events. So uh, there you go. A lot of artists are canceling their tours. They just don't want to do that many cities. They can't do that many cities, you know, or they're not interested in doing that many cities. And so they, you know, I think that one of the challenges really, whether it's live streaming or theaters or, or whatever, the artists have to find another way to do this because 
when the bottom fell out of CD sales, you know, CDs, you know, the concerts used to be the promotion for selling the records, you know, so the, the tickets were $15 and no one was trying to make money. They were just trying to cover their costs. And then it became something that everyone had to make money at because the CDs weren't making any money anymore. <laughs> and so, so they, they got, they pushed over, but then they just, they just ran dry. They're just running dry, you know? And I think that that's, they, the artists can't handle this many, uh, tour dates this, this, this many years in a row, um, but it's the only way they can make money. And so I think that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunity when it comes to, if you look at, I mean, there's some bands that figured this out a long time ago. You look at a band like fish, they've been doing live shows, you know, to people's homes, you know, home viewing for a decade more or more, you know, and they have built up a whole thing. They don't have to go anywhere, you know, and, and they figured it out a long time ago. Next question. Next question in from me, and uh, I want to know, what are the reviews saying about the new Sony FR7? Have you seen any reviews, Mitchell? I have not. I'm just curious yeah. why I haven't seen. Well, they're not. I know our reviews. Yet. Yeah, <laughs> we're very excited. <laughs> That's our review so far. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think they're in production yet, so I think that there's only a handful of units floating around. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I just looked and checked to see uh, who's shipping, and and most most of the people that say they're selling is promising October, the middle of October for delivery. So, I don't think they're in the pipeline yet. So, you're probably not going to see any honest reviews until uh, they get into the hands of the yeah. users out there. Yeah, and and it's you know I think it's going to come down to the interface. I mean, the 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 FX six and the and the FR seven share the same sensor, so it's it's going to look a lot like that. It's just a matter of in a much different body um, and and how it's processed. And so I think it'll be really interesting to see. Um, you know, so I think you can, we know what it's going to look like. It's just a matter of what kind of controls does it, does it have. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was looking at it, at, and I was thinking, well, you know, it's it's much you know, much smaller. It's a much smaller package than your typical hot head or, or remote controlled head for use in the end of a jib arm. Mm -hmm. And so, for replacing those kind of cameras in a cinema type setup, yeah. um, it seems like it would be very uh, very useful. Although it does have, a, if you look at the connections on the back of the thing, there's a lot of in, in, gazintas and gazatas there. You got your time code in, your SDI out, you've got an optical connection, you may be able to do everything there. You got power, you got HDMI out, you have an option. Hmm, what is yeah. that? And you have a, you know, five pin audio in and a gen lock uh, port. So with Real all the ports, camera. there's going to be a regular, you know, plethora of cables you're going to have to hook up to that thing, but at least the cables don't have to rotate with the head. So they're well, in the static base of the head. So that's a good thing. And at least they're there. You know, like the, the thing is, is that they, you know, for a lot of these PTZs, you don't get all of those things, especially at that price point. So, so I think it's pretty, you know, again, I don't know what, it, how it will actually work. Uh, but given that it's Sony, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that it's probably going to be a pretty good camera. It's probably going to work pretty close to what we expect. Um, and if it does, it's good. They're going to sell as many as they can make. Like the, the, this is, you know, this is, this is an explosive camera. It's probably the most explosive camera I've seen in a long time because you look at it, people like us, YouTubers, um, as well as lots of other folks that, you know, of course we can talk about, oh, it's not going to do 20 X from the back of a room. That's not going to last much longer anyway. <laughs> like, like that business is, is not going to be there much longer. Yeah, the so, thing, um, the business the is going to be close-ups. The other thing that made me nervous was looking at the back there, there's a fan on it and I just hope it doesn't go the red route and make a, a noisy yeah. fan, you know, that yeah, hopefully be, that would be a real bummer. Yeah. Count. Yeah, exactly. Because and where that where those kinds of thought processes come from, oftentimes are filmmakers who think, well, we're, we're going to do something else with the audio anyway. So they don't give them that feedback. And then they, you go into a studio and you're like, oh, that's not going to work at all. But but I think that for studios, I mean, I know that I'm doing a bunch of stuff where we do lots of roundtables and so on and so forth. And this is just going to be we're going to jump right. You know, we're we're ready to buy like the, these cameras, like four or five of them almost immediately. I know that Noah's already got a pre-order going and, you know, a lot of us are, you know, ready to buy them sight unseen just because they, we know what they'll solve. And you're right though, that if the fan is too loud, it'll be a bummer. Go ahead, Mitchell. Um, speaking about the fan, uh, if it shares any of the tech with the FX3, which I have here, which has a fan in it, it's on the body. Um, I've never heard it come on, and I've fired up uh, mm -hmm. the full uh, 120 frames per second output and pushed the camera, and it came on, but I'd never heard it. So it's, it, I don't think they would have it be louder than an FX3, for sure. Yeah, and, and I think that the other, the other thing is Sony has built a lot of PTC cameras, so I think they're pretty conscious to what, 
what that is, but I, I have to say I would have probably owned 20 of these, you know, in my last, my last company, because just being able to throw these up, this is as far as kits go for remote ends and round tables and studio production, everything else, having a full frame sensor on a camera that is PTZ is, is pretty magical. You know, so it's, it's, it's going to be, I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, we're very excited and maybe we'll come maybe th- two months from now, we'll be bummed out and angry, but, uh, but you know, I, I feel pretty excited about what they did here. We've all been asking for super 35 and, uh, and full frames for a decade. Like, Hey, if we just had something that would look really good. And so I was using telemetrics heads with Ursa cameras, um, for the, you know, five years because that's, that's the best we could do. And it looked great. But this will look at this will look really good if it dark, if it if it matches the look of the FX six um, and you'll see me over this weekend uh, I will be on an FX six <laughs> this weekend as a test so tomorrow I'll be on the FX six to we'll, we'll be I'm getting it it's taking me a little time to get it set up but I, I'm going to test it over the weekend um, go ahead uh, Stefan uh, will these cameras come with uh, their own lenses or uh, so it's do you buy you know, new ones for that. Yeah, you'll need. Yeah, so when you see the ninety six hundred, you got to budget another two grand for the lens. Um, you know, depending on what you're going to buy, but they they are Sony mounts, so they're you, you do. But you have interchangeable lenses, which is kind of exciting. Um, they won't handle everything, but they seem to handle the up. To, I think the seventy two hundred or or something in that range is still available. So again, this isn't a conference camera, and which w- you wouldn't be able to do anyway. At a full frame sensor, you wouldn't be able to maintain focus um, from the back of a room. So this is really more of a studio camera, um, a uh, personal camera, those those types of jib camera, those types of things. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it looks like you can build it out because it's got uh, rod adapters on the front, which could be used to support a matte box or uh, a lens uh, holder if yep. your lens is a little bit long. So I think you got it covered there. Well, you can't hold the lens if it's long on a PTZ. Otherwise, it's no longer a PTZ. But but the, um, uh, but the I think that it, it will... Um, it, it doesn't have it. The motors are just become a limit of what it can handle from a weight perspective. Um, and I think I can't remember what the weight was. I think it was like four pounds, I think, or something like that. I can't remember what it was. I might, uh, that's some, that seems really heavy. So I don't think it's four pounds, but anyway, it's, it's, um, there is, there's a limit to the weights. Um, the, and that's, what's going to limit the lens. And I think the 200 mil is the, the longest lens that I think was rated for it. So anyway, we'll, we'll keep on paying attention and seeing what happens. Next question. Nigel Dessau from Austin, Texas, and here on the panel, if budget was not an issue, but the ease of use is, would you recommend a Logitech Brio or Insta360 as a webcam? Good, Nigel. Yeah, I have a, f- a friend who's uh, building quite a, a backing with their uh, their podcast, and but they want to up their game from their computer to a better camera. And, and I appreciate the Insta360 is double the price, but I'm concerned that the controls will throw complexity into it. I think Brio is a lot easier, but I, I've not used the 360, so I was looking for opinions. Go ahead, John. Yeah, the Brio is going to be more like the point and shoot, and the Insta360 is going to require a lot more work, as well as it could potentially move, and if they're not competent enough to, to do that, it's going to be more frustrating than it is going to be about getting a good uh, signal for them. I think your best bet's probably just picking up like an old A7, A5100 from Sony and a capture card, and it's going to look great. It's going to look better than both of those, so... That's that's sort of my option there. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely have something that looks. I will say, ease of use now. I mean, and I've ha- I have two of the Insta three sixties now. Uh, I find that there is a little bit of a, there's almost no bump of figuring it out. You have to download the software. The only reason that our kits that we're sending out, if we send them out without a computer, the only reason they're not going out with the Insta three sixties is because I don't want to have someone have to download a p- separate piece of software. Once they download that software, though, the Insta360 is infinitely easier to use than the Brio. The manual controls are much better than what we what we see. And and you know, you, you put your hand up the wrong way, and it just starts following you around. And you're sitting there talking, and it just it just I was I was talking to uh, I was talking to Andy Carlucci yesterday, and I suddenly realized that it was it was tracking. <laughs> it started rocking back and forth like I didn't notice that it was doing it. And um and so the uh, uh so I think that uh. You definitely, um, the 360 is all I'm going to use. If I'm, if, if, if I was going to send somebody, again, someone that hasn't, that I'm going to send the kit, they're only going to use it once. They're going to plug it into their computer. I'm probably going to send them a Brio because of that software install. But the webcam settings don't hold a candle to what I can do with the, the and it's very manual. When you open up the Insta360 um, interface, you literally just tap on the screen and move it to pan. <laughs> like you just go, it's not like you can grab onto this little thing, but you can just tap on it and just move it 
um, up. I want to look here and then you can save presets. So you can sit there. I want to look at this and now I want to look at the, I want to look down. I want to look over here. And I haven't, the reason I got a second one was, well, first, because I lost the first one, but I, I found it <laughs> But anyway, but the, um, but I also knew that I wanted to get a second one because I, there's a drop down menu at the top. So I think that you can actually control. Um, it's one of the things on my list over the next week to test is controlling two of these at the same time. So you can just drop down and say, okay, this is the one I want to actually run now so that you can set all these presets. Now, the, the thing that I hope that they do is open up the API so that we can, we can actually, you know, control these. Cause if they do that, we'll have a lot more. The other thing, it's not just the, the point and shoot of the Insta360 that makes it great. It's the fact that the color management is so much better than webcam settings. And so, so you're able to, you, there, you can actually apply a curve you know, to, to the exposure. Um, and, and so you have curves, you have, uh, you can set it, you, you, lots of intricate settings to the, to the color management of the, of it, which has been a problem with the Brio, to be honest. It's even with webcam settings, sometimes it gets into a state that we just can't get a color that we're happy with, depending on the background. It just does an auto correction that isn't, doesn't work. You know, there's a limit to the, to the UVC control <clears throat> that goes out to the Brio. And so I think, uh, again, if I was sending it out for one, a one use to somebody else's computer, still a Brio, if I'm going to tell someone what to get at home where they can spend a little time, like 20 minutes learning how to use it, 360 all the way, you know, for, as a webcam. Um, now John's absolutely correct that you could get a better looking camera you know, with a little bit of another hundred bucks, 200 bucks, you could get a better looking camera that's going to have a short depth of field. But I will say as a kind of like I, for this show, of course, I want to use a bigger, bigger sensor on day to day at the office. I'm using the Insta 360 because it's just super convenient because every time I want to reframe, I just open up and just go, oh, I'm just going to move down here. And I don't have to go up there and like doing it by yourself, like going up there. And the problem that I, the reason that I only use black magics typically for this is because I can, check focus and change exposure and do all these other things without having to go back there and fiddle with the camera. When you're by yourself, you have to do that. And you're not there. You're not in front of the camera when you're, when you're adjusting the camera, it's a problem. So the Insta360 fixes that. Anyway, I, I think it's a pretty good, pretty sharp camera. We were excited about it. I wasn't sure, but we've now, I, I again, internally, we're all going to be using those. Um, I think it's the, it's the best one so far. Uh, next question. And next question is from me. I can understand using two microphones on a podium one main and one backup, but why would there be five at the same kind? Only the, five? Only, only five? five. And, and to clarify, I didn't want to put the picture up because it's a mm -hmm. uh, another foreign power, but so he it has is. seven, actually, well, on his Sometimes there's, there, used to be, there used to be like 20. Yeah, go ahead, um, um, Courtney. Well, it's um, they could use them for backup, and they used to, in the olden days before press boxes and distribution. They used to have you know one mic for each network and for distribution to the network pools uh, before they pooled everybody into one uh, distribution box. But what they probably use it for is to turn that cardioid pattern of that dynamic microphone into a dynamic island. Sorry, Apple. I violated your IP <laughs> license there. No, so you, you spread out, if you put like six mics that are, di uh, you know, uh, uh, dynamic mics, so they have a fairly narrow uh, pattern pickup and you have to be fairly close to them, um, then as the person leans left or right or turns around and says, I'd like to introduce my cohort, uh, they're not turning quite off mic and then you just hook them all up to a Dugan Auto Mix, mm -hmm. which will control the mm -hmm. output and that'll cover yourself as a backup. That'll cover yourself for two people at the podium at the same time, which is always a problem with a fixed mic. And uh, so you have much more control over the pattern that way with a, uh, a row of microphones that are all hooked into a common mixer that you can auto mix between the levels of, of any of them and keep the and keep the feedback down because only one of them is turned up at a time. Go ahead, Mitchell. Except uh, this person doesn't move around a lot. They look like uh, animatronics, so uh, it's, I mean, it's weird. Usually, usually it comes down to trust. So, and, and who has enough? You know, so I've worked on a lot of these, and generally those mics are exactly as was outlined. They're def, they're generally for the networks and um, for different networks. And a lot of times, what happens is is they don't trust each other 
to feed them a good signal. You know, so they're afraid of line noise. They're afraid of it not being managed properly. Someone running the fader on them, you know, that type of thing. And so um, typically when you see a whole cluster of mics, that is a mic for every news organization. They want their own pipeline. When I'm there, I want my own because I don't trust the folks that are there. Um, so, so it, it, it is, um, so everybody jostles to, you know, and, and depends on who's got the most juice <laughs> who's that, that can, that can get up there and, and, and push that I'm going to have a mic or we're not going to cover the event or we're going to do, da, 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 you know, or they put it in like, if we're going to show up, this is what we expect. What you're not seeing is on the back end of that, on the other side of the crowd or on the, on, on the behind, behind it is a whole slew of cameras and they're doing all the same thing they're, They want their own camera there. They don't want the pool feed or they want, you know, the networks want this generally, but a lot of folks do. It's, it's access. It's saying that we were actually there when it happened and we're not, you know, this didn't go through some other uh, edit um, and so on and so forth. And so, um, so typically, and, and one of the fundamental problems is uh, with this is the, that the press box, you know, the, the, the pool feeds tend to be really bad. So, you know, the, the, they tend to have a ton of line noise because everyone's plugging into them and we're getting, you know, you get all kinds of circuit loops, you know, that are in it. And so you can, that you, a lot of times when you see these, or these news, news things, <clears throat> anybody who's sharing that press pool has a, has a buzz, you know, to it, um, that, that, that is pretty indicative of that, of that process. And so, you know, what we did to do, to, to get rid of a lot of that is a little bit of carrot, a little bit of stick <laughs> you know, to, 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 to solve it, which is that, um, what we would do, because a lot of times I worked for the folks that were, on stage. <laughs> so, so what we would do is we had the best mics. Um, all the other mics were pulled back just a little bit so that our mics had, had space, <laughs> you know, it's to, to, to look at it and they are all kind of where they were in the same sense. We made sure we used uh, Dante to the press boxes to reduce the amount of, um, any kind and put them on battery, you know, which seems crazy, but the battery will last forever, you know, like, and so, so now it doesn't, you're not, you're, you have a very low chance of any kind of loops going on, you know, with that, with that process. Um, and then, and then we, you know, we, we very carefully work through it. If we heard anything in that press pool box, we would, we would address it, you know, rather than just saying, well, that's the best you could do. Um, so we really focused on that um, to make sure that it was high quality. The second thing that we did was that we separated our cameras from the um, press pool. So what that meant was we'd push our camera forward. So it was about three feet forward of the press pool. And the, our operator sat, stood on the press pool's uh, <laughs> Well, oftentimes our operator didn't even stand on it. We separated them as well. So they were separated completely. So, and the reason that that's important is the rest of the press pool is sitting on a shared riser with photographers. Photographers don't care about video. So the whole thing is just, that's why when you look at political things, you'll see all this little shaking going on. The photographers <laughs> are running around taking pictures. And so, so the whole thing shaking, ours is rock solid. We would use super 35 sensors and make it look really nice with big zoom lenses. We tuned everything because they all come in a couple hours before we had all day. So we would get it to, to where it was looking just right. We had all the bits and pieces. We then put it out to a press pool and especially for international events, we would, pre we would do all the conversion for them. So we would convert it to 10 and 25 and, you know, like whatever it was, we would also tie in all the languages. And so there was just little nicely labeled. These are the different languages and the different formats. And it was just a couple routers with Terranexes and, you know, all kinds of stuff that was all set up. We also had, um, we would record it to SD card. <laughs> you know, so, so we could hand it to the social networks and to some of the news networks automatically. And then of course we put it on satellite. And so by doing that, um, what we, what, if you worked with us a couple of times with the same folks, what we saw was less and less press showing up because they're, they want to show up, but their producers are like, if I'm going to get that feed for free and this feed that I have to pay someone to go, go do, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so, so they, uh, you know, and so the producers just, you know, we just played to the producers and it, it reduced the number of people down to only the ones that really, you know, the network still came, but it really called out most of the um, local and smaller providers. Um, and that made it a lot easier for us. It just makes it less chaotic. That's, that's all we were trying to do is make it less chaotic. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael is here. It's been said that a second monitor is essential streaming hardware to display your streaming software. For example, with the rise of the stream deck and companion, has that changed? Go ahead, Courtney. I'm not sure how the stream deck would really, you know, give you more, um, you know, space to real estate to look at your images on. 
Uh, you can never have enough monitors, in my opinion. <laughs> Too many monitors, uh, they say if you're doing live streaming, you know, you can have eye line troubles because you're looking around, looking at all the different monitors. Mm -hmm. But if you have a, a teleprompter for one of your monitors, that solves one of the problems, but you still have to have some space that you put up your working software on or your research software or your control software. Um, you know, it's you, you do need multiple monitors, I think, in most setups. Uh, I only have... Well, I have three here, but probably a lot less than most of the other people on this panel. Good, John. Yeah, for me, it, it comes down to how much information do I want at my hands. Uh, being able to push a button and have something happen is great, but if I can't validate that it actually happened, it's not useful to me. Uh, so I don't think that I, you should have at least two monitors. I have three or four usually in front of me, making sure I understand what's happening, what does my feed look like going out, what am I actually sending so I can validate the information that I'm sending out is good and what people are receiving is exceptional? Yeah, it depends on what you're, whether you're streaming yourself or something else. I think two is probably minimum. Remember that you can get those, you can get things that mount to your to your table, like most of mine. I have s about seven. Um, and I have uh, three ARM trees, which is basically two ARMs. They have, and they're not that expensive, but there's two, they hold two monitors. Um, two of them are, you know, hit the base of the table. One, they, I can stack them over top of each other. And um, and so that helps me kind of organize them. So it's if it's a matter of space, really look at the, you know, um, the, the different arms that you can get that would let you attach it one place and and then basically fly them, fly them around. Um, that allows you to also just build them into the orientation that you'd like as well. Next question. Stefan Fischer from Würzburg, Germany. What brand recommendation does the panel have for mobile power supplies besides classical UPSs? I mean, the battery-powered ones, not the fueled ones. Coach Stefan? Yeah, in Germany, we have a lot of uh, discussion about power outage because of uh, some kind of energy crisis. And um, yeah, I was just thinking about there are a lot of brands around uh, um, many, many options available, but what to take. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, go ahead, Mitchell. I see a lot of the, the red box Jackery uh, power mm -hmm. supplies. I don't personally have one, but I see so many of them. They must be something. Go ahead, John. We just went, I just went camping with Fenwick and Keenan and Jack in the mountains, and they all have Geniverse. They just changed their name to, because there was confusion with Generac and this, and this, these guys. Mm -hmm. and, and do so, they take do they take solar as well they take solar they in fact they sell a kit and that's what we had out there is we had mm -hmm. a bunch of solar panels fed into these batteries and we nobody had a, a fuel-based generator at all they worked fantastic and which and who made them again it's i just put the link in the chat room okay great yeah the um the, the main thing is to look for the, the feature that you want is solar to you know solar to battery you know that's what, what really steps up and there's quite a few of them. I have I have a Jackery as well, um, but I'm looking at a bunch of other ones. As you know, it's it it works great, but I'm looking at some larger ones that um, might might be able to power a lot more of my office. And so um, so those are. But what I'm the the combination is, I want to make sure that I can power it. I can charge it from house current as well as from uh, solar. Uh, solar panels so that it can so it can charge up and a lot of times it can that way you can always know that you can top it off go ahead courtney yeah i found i every time i go to costco i usually see one of these things and and here's one that they're selling now i don't know what what the price is because it's members only but it, it's designed for use with solar panels but it's portable it comes on a little rack that you can roll it around it has internal lithium-ion batteries um and a inverter uh, so you can get ac out of it so uh they're pretty plentiful you can get them at Costco, and I think this is three thousand watts, right? Something like that. And one of the ones that has a that's been around probably the longest that that has a lot of features is uh, Goal Zero is another one to look at. They they that was the one this. I just showed the Goal Zero. Oh, zero. I, I didn't see it big enough. So yeah, right. so I didn't Goal mention zero. the brand name. Yeah, Goal yeah. Zero Yeti. But that, those are probably they've been they really started early <laughs> with this process, and so they've got a lot of experience there too. Next question. And here's Douglas Carmichael asking, I'll be definitely going with the blue Sona for a mic, but would the Logitech Litra Beam, and there's a link to it, or Litra Glow above my monitors be a good start for lighting? Go ahead, Mitchell. I, I said this to Douglas again. I'm, apparently, Douglas, you're not listening to me. Um, nobody's uh, had a chance to, uh, to evaluate that blue Sona microphone. It looks interesting. 
Uh, the specs seem pretty good. But I would wait till there's some reviews on it so people have had a chance because where the rubber really hits the road is how it sounds. All right, go ahead, John. Um, so Douglas' question about lighting, I would get bigger lights than that. Um, you know, uh, no, uh, some lighting is better than no lighting. Uh, get as far away from you as you can. If you can put it in some sort of box to kind of spread the light out and diffuse it, it might be more useful for you. Uh, but bigger lighting than anything else. Um, as far as the microphone goes, it's been reviewed several times. Some people on the uh, After Hours already have it. It does sound pretty good. Uh, Mickey has uh, taken a listen to it as well, um, likes it as well. So just um, definitely something that uh, interesting to try out. Sp essentially, it's an SM7B with the built-in... Uh, um, I can't think of the, the word, uh, like a booster in it. So next question. Next question in from Stefan Fischer in Würzburg, Germany here on the panel. Any recommendation on a wireless audio receiver with XLR out to hook on a black magic cinema camera price point below $1,000. George Stefan. Yeah. Uh, I refer, uh, uh, um, Reference to the, the ones we used at the IBC, it was a little Sennheiser kit, but it had only a TRS check out uh, to, to hook on the camera. And I was looking for something different, uh, not as expensive at the lesser, uh, less electrosonics uh, we, we got supplied with. Are you, uh, I guess the question is, is are you trying to actually use the, the, the content, use the audio that's going into the camera, or are you just using it for, for reference? No, I, I just want to use it so that we, I kind of get rid of these TRS cable uh, um, and uh, use the uh, XLR in on the Blackmagic Cinema camera. But that's what, what, when you do a final delivery, you want to use the content that's, yeah. that's going in. Because the thing I would say is that I would almost never do that. <laughs> the reason, the reason is, is that even if you're doing the 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 thing with going into the camera, number one is the preamp for the camera is not in all these cameras is not great. So you know now you are just sending a line out, but now your the risk is is that your final your final content, the only copy you have potentially, is going into that camera from a wireless connection. So if you have anything stomp on it in any way, shape or form, you now don't have any audio. Um, you know, so I'm a big, big fan of, um, anytime I'm not moving, I'll try to wire the can uh, wire the mics. Number one, <laughs> like if I'm, if, if the person's not moving, I'm not moving. I want wired. Second thing is, is that if it's, if they are moving, I want to, as soon as it comes off the first transmitter, if someone's talking now, if you're talking about, are you talking about someone talking and it going straight into the camera for like ENG style? Um, if you're doing that, then the thing to be careful of is that there, I mean, the Sennheisers are probably the best under a thousand dollars and you can get converters for those that will just go to XLR, you know, so that even though that's not what you had with the Sennheiser, potentially you, there are connectors from there to there. But what I will say is under a thousand dollars for a trans transmitter or a receiver is you just have to be in a quiet space. Like <laughs> you get into the city, you get into a, a dense location and mo almost all of them will fall apart. Like that's, I mean, that's kind of the, that's why the other ones are more expensive is because it's a lot better electronics and a lot better, you know, um, frequency management and so on and so forth. And so anything under a thousand dollars is going to fall apart in a dense env environment at some point, you know, like you don't, it may not be in the first one you do, but I, I spent my first three or four years using Sennheiser ENG 100s and, and so on and so forth. And it's kind of constant. <laughs> like it was like dancing with the frequencies was a constant problem. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I mean, if your camera has an XLR balanced in, I would stay away from wireless connection to it, uh, just run a cable to it, uh, if it's all possible. You know, if it's run and gun, that's something else. And like Alex said, it's it's dangerous because if that's your only recording is on the camera, on the camera video, on camera video, uh, if you're not recording double system like your sound mixer is, you know, that's transmitting to this receiver is not recording it locally for a backup, you know, that could be problematic since usually nobody's monitoring what's coming into the camera. Um, usually the cameraman hate to put a earphone in to monitor what's going coming out of the camera. And plus, if you're going any kind of wireless link out of that camera to monitors, <clears throat> that can interfere and and greatly reduce the reception range of that receiver that you're putting on the camera as well because the transmitter for the video output will swamp the input for the uh, analog audio so you'll never know when you drop in and out of range go ahead mitchell 
Yeah, general rule of thumb, if you see a 3.5 millimeter connector for a mic or line in on a camera, chances are it's got a, a lousy uh, preamp in it. Just or they because all, of chances yeah, are maybe camera a camera has a lou- lousy preamp. Yeah, the camera does. Uh, <laughs> they, all have, Alex, they all have lousy. In, in. Alex is confirming. So, uh, for example, on my Sony's, um, I've used the, uh, the 3.5 millimeter just to check it out, and it's noisy in El Crudo. Um, yeah, a lot of times you can buy adapters, uh, like on my uh, ZV-E10, it has an M1 uh, slide-on adapter, and it, uh, it it bypasses all the analog circuitry and makes it digital. Same with the FX3, it's got a handle uh, and an XLR and a preamp built into that if you choose to use it. But uh, like Alex said, if you see that 3.5 millimeter, don't do it. Well, again, you can you can convert the, the Sennheisers, and, and so... On a day-to-day basis, if you're just doing stuff that is less critical, you know, a Sennheiser, you know, ENG or, or something like that may work as far as experimentation. But remember that these mics, the other thing is these wireless mics are generally not very expensive to rent. So as soon as you go into, I mean, you can rent an electrosonic, you know, for things that are mission critical um, or rent or look at audio limited from, from sound devices because in Europe in audio lim- with audio limited, you can record at the transmitter. So, um, so audio, you know, the, the audio limited ones have recording capabilities at the transmitter so that now you can have someone you know, if they have a, a lav on or whatever, they can be recording and sending it to you. Now, if something went, happened, you have both copies. Um, Zaxcom does that, of course, here in, in the United States. But but the um, but that's a patent process, and I think I believe that uh, I do believe that Deity uh, licensed the licensed the, the opportunity to do that as well. So Deity is another mic to look at as um, for that. But if you're going to use wireless that costs less money, find a way to record at the transmitter. Um, in one way, shape, or form, so that you know that that's not the only one. There is nothing worse than having a great interview or a great thing that you covered with little pops and and uh, noise and other things that come with wireless. Uh, it's, and wireless is a, it's always a thing. <laughs> so we use it. We use it. I mean, we definitely use it with video and with audio, but we always try to have a wired connection to the world somewhere to make sure that it works. Next question. Next question in from Douglas Carmichael. If your desk space can't support two full-size monitors, would Siphon be a useful workaround to capture a desktop source with your streaming software on a virtual desktop? Or would a small auxiliary monitor like a Uber per, per, Uber Uberfect be a better choice? Sorry about that. Uh, go ahead, John. Uh, I would prefer a small monitor, but you can also use a, like a cheap uh, HDMI dummy plugs. And it'll create a virtual source that you can then scrape from there. Next question. Stefan Fischer from Wurzburg, Germany. What makes companies require NDAs from production people? What do they not want the public to know? It can't be the technical details, can it? Good, Nigel. So I think there's a couple of things because there's a lot of different examples here. If you're making a, uh, a Marvel movie, they don't want you to leak what you see. Uh, that they're recording or producing. But for most of us, what we don't want is not what goes out, but what you hear in the background. The comments, the arguments, the discussion, it's the off-air stuff that often we don't want leaked out. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yeah, most, um, <clears throat> you know, right around uh, the mid-90s to late-90s as as the internet became a thing, um, they didn't want anyone stealing their thunder so, especially on dramatic programs that are producing or theatrical films, they don't want anyone with behind-the-scenes stuff that they don't have control over. And uh, they have very tight licensing agreements on those characters. And so, you know, they have to get involved with a lot of lawsuits. So just having everybody sign an NDA so that uh, you're less likely to post something on social media uh, covers a lot of their bases, saves them a lot of money uh, just to, uh, as a prevention method. I mean, there are people that will be shooting stuff on on set, uh, but if it ever shows up on social media anywhere, expect a knock on your door from the media lawyers. Yeah, yeah, it's it's protecting their, you know, everything. <laughs> like it's it's not just protect it's protecting, you know, oftentimes the sausage uh um, you know, making the sausage, making an event, you know, for production is not nearly as pretty as it would as it would normally sound uh, seem. And so, there's just a lot of things that you're working through in, in real time. And so, that's one of the challenges. Um, and then the uh, uh, the the other thing that you you have is all the content 
all the products, conversations about products that are coming in the future, conversations about how the company runs, um, even location. A lot of times if we're building up a live event, we don't, we don't want a whole bunch of people to show up somewhere. So, you know, like, so we've done events that are top secret, they're launching something or whatever. We're in the middle of nowhere. Now, in addition to the NDAs, uh, our crew, we had one that was pretty high profile in, um, in Utah. We didn't, the crew got instructions on where to go when they landed. Like if you didn't make it for some reason, you missed your flight. You're never going to know where we were. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, and, and, and so, and so once you landed and, 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 and we're leaving the airport, we'd tell you where to go, you know, and, and those kinds of things. And that was on top of the NDAs was just, um, intense information control. Um, and you know, for our crews, um, a lot of times well, with Pixacore, at least we, we wouldn't let you, um, we would not let you put post to social media with a reference or, or a GPS location within 10 miles of our look of our event. You know, like literally if, if you were on our crew and you posted a picture of your dinner in Paris, we, you'd never be on our crew again. <laughs> it was in the, it was in the agreement, you know, to do it. It was like nothing. Cause what, what people, everyone wants to promote what they did on, well with, with what I did in the past, everything was high profile. Everything was the cool thing that people were talking about on the news. And so everyone wanted to show off that they were working on it. And so you have this constant pressure for people. And we just were like, nothing, nothing can go out. And that's why we got to work on those shows is because the information leakage out of our, out of what we did was almost zero, you know, like it was, you know, and uh, leakage when you're trying to build these things is just a massive issue. And so um, we were pretty, again, we found it to be the NDAs were the beginning of that, but there were just lots of instructions, lots of people watching. If you posted something on YouTube or LinkedIn, you'd immediately get an email from us. <laughs> like you got to take that down right now, <laughs> like you know, like it's, because that's how you know companies feel way better about working with you when they know that you're going to protect their back. Go ahead, Courtney. And another thing, it can be the technical de details because a lot of times when you're shooting, you know, if you're shooting commercials for a new product that hasn't been introduced yet, um, you're working with prototypes. They're not even finished. They don't have the final software. They don't. They may even change the name of the product before it's released. I worked on Apple's Apple commercials where they hadn't decided to name the iBook until we finished the commercial, and they had to superimpose the name onto the product yeah. because they hadn't come up with the name yet. They were still testing. So that's why they, uh, you know, if you're if there's information that leaks out ahead of time. Uh, it may be a, a completely wrong representation of the hardware mm -hmm. that you're shooting because it's a, a work in progress still. So that's another reason they have you sign we, lots of NDAs. When we go to some of these events, they give us stickers, big red stickers that we have to put on our camera lenses. Oh, it's much harder now. The stickers have to get a lot bigger because Apple has a whole bunch of these. But you're supposed to put the sticker on the camera before you – and, and people are looking at it all the time when you put your camera up to – Make sure that your cameras, it's, it's a silly thing to some degree, especially for people like me that have a bunch of phones, <laughs> but, but, but it's, it's a, it's very clear not to take pictures. Uh, go ahead, Nigel. I was just reminded, but uh, I used to work with a fairly high profile CEO from a technology company whose uh, practice uh, experience when he was preparing for a presentation was to best say destructive to everybody within a three mile radius. And there was no way he would have wanted that recorded or replayed because that was not the image he had in the marketplace. Yeah. And, and it's just, and, and we have to remember that for the most part, if you're a large company or you're an individual um, that is a you know VIP, everybody wants a little bit of something. They want some picture of you. They want some whatever they want. You know, they're all looking for the next thing they can put on Twitter. And um, the best thing to do is to, uh, is to just you sign everybody <laughs> everybody just you sign them all through as they come through and uh, and and close as much of it down as you can and still things get out but it definitely reduces it the, the, the temptation because depending on if people actually read those ndas a lot of times the consequences of leakage is significant um you know uh, so next question next question uh, is for me why do you think people might cancel their netflix account i go ahead courtney well, because they keep raising the darn price. Uh, here's here's a uh, a chart of Netflix price increases uh, from uh, 2015 to the present, and their top tier is going to twenty dollars, I think, and the medium tier, which is just HD and two screens only, is going up to fifteen fifty, and they still have that introductory level, but that's standard definition, and who the heck watches standard definition anymore? So. Um, you know, I think uh, the expense gets more and more, and plus their original material 
they're finding uh, they're putting less and less money into original programming now. I think they've they've called home that uh, problem of you know producing original content gets uh, gets quite expensive, and they've invested a whole lot of money in original content in the last couple of few years that hasn't really returned its investment that well. So I think they're they're dropping back and putting less money into original content now and trying to reap a little more from their existing subscribers. So I think they're going to have a lot of fallout of subscriptions because of the increase in prices and the reduction of the number of unique programs. Go ahead, John. I think it comes down to if you haven't opened the app in a couple months and you notice the the bill come across your credit card, that you're going to look at it and think, do I really need this? And that's going to lead to those discussions or with the family, is it Apple Plus or is it Netflix? What are we going to do when you're looking at saving 20 bucks a month? Uh, what does that look like for you? I, I changed my credit card number and, and Netflix wasn't working and I suddenly realized it hadn't been working for like three months. It's like, oh, I haven't gone to Netflix in three months. <laughs> hadn't thought about it. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it, it seems like there's a lot more competition for streaming plus services from a lot of different places. And as they uh, uh, force you to make decisions, I think Netflix is making the wrong decisions by not improving the quality of their, not necessarily quantity, but the quality of their programming, as Courtney said. And uh, the fact that they're going to start running commercials it's just going to make it a no deal for me. There you go, Nigel. I think it'd be interesting to see the elasticity when they put those $1 price increases up, how many people they lose. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm sort of with Courtney. I think as, as that price increase comes, at some point that price will be greater than the value of the original programming they're creating. And when you hit that perception point, people will cancel. Yeah, and, I, and I think that, I actually think they're going the wrong way, which is that they, um, that, Everyone keeps on trying to do these big hits, but those are massive risks. The things that I watch, the things that I look for at, at, at Netflix is, um, I, I'm, what I'm looking for are things like the chef's table, things like um, song exploder, things like things that are very niche that I'm interested in. Maybe that's the wrong thing, but the thing is, is that these big ones are like not working and they stopped making all the stuff that was, that kept me in a, in, that wanted to subscribe. You know, Disney, I think is hitting that just right where they're just doing tons of all this extra stuff that's around it like light and magic which is much less expensive to produce than than the movies and has the same hold value if you re release them over time um, next question mike burns from spokane washington uh speaking of live events who's watching billy eilish this weekend on apple plus now that you mentioned it, I maybe I will. <laughs> I didn't know what was happening, <laughs> so I'm sure we'll, we'll, when is it? Do we know when that 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 is actually? Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out when that when that's actually happening. I think it's sometime this weekend. So we'll we'll take a look. It'd be interesting to see how they treat it. Um, next question: Hershey Trivetti from Daytona Beach, Florida, and here on our panel, capture cards are a good piece of equipment to have around. Aside from Cam Link, what are the other ones you may recommend? Go ahead, Nigel. So I think you have to start down the ATEM Mini line. I think ATEM is the capture card I would I would recommend people start with. You can buy one quite cheap on eBay um, as they upgrade the other spin-off. And there are lots of other things, but that's that's more of a multi-purpose tool that you're going to be able to use and expand. Of course, the downside of that is you'll start with the mini and then you'll go to the extreme and then you'll go to the ISO and you didn't want to spend that much money. But it's <laughs> it's a great way to to get into that whole world. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, John. Like uh, Elgato, a Aver Media, Black Magic, all have great products for HDMI capture. Um, but yeah, ATEM is definitely a great solution. Yeah, the ATEM. The, the one. The, sometimes the what you what you're looking for is something that's just in a box that does the thing. And so that's the you know. So there's a lot of. I mean, there's a lot of them. AGA makes a lot of the ones we've used in the past. Um, the other ones, of course, are Black Magic, and so. I, I just moved mine down to the office, but you know, everything from the, the quad duos, the quads or the duos, the, you know, so there's these deck link cards that, you know, and then of course, AJ has their own version of those. Um, and so those are card cards that are going to go into a computer or into a device that are going to, it's going to allow you to have a higher density. Like the, the quad will allow you to bring in up to eight sources at a time. Um, while the uh, duo does a four and, or you can have four in four out. So you have a lot of flexibility in those areas. And then of course you have the whole ultra studio line, which we've had. One of the things that you look at with the ultra studios is the ability in to the larger ones, the mini and the full size ones 
give you a lot of IO. So you're able to bring those in, you're able to do 444, you're able to do, you know, up to 8k, you're able to do a lot of other things that are there um, for for those captures. And so, um, you know, it just depends on what you're what you're looking for. The mini recorders are a great kind of smaller, you know, solution as well that these are the little mini recorders will do HDMI and SDI and uh, to your Thunderbolt. And that's a great little one that's not very expensive that does a great job. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, one thing a lot of people overlook is the uh, Blackmagic uh, Video Assists. They've got a whole line of little monitors that also record at 12K, and they have SDI input, they have HDMI input, they record on SD cards, and they also have scopes built in, they have high-def monitors, they do HDR, uh, and they're standalone recorders, so you don't need to have a computer hooked up to them to record. So they're a useful tool that records, uh, and they do a really decent job. I have to say, I got to play with one of the 12Gs recently, and I, I haven't bought it yet, and I'm just buying them. Find so many other things from Black Magic right now that I can't. Um, but the uh, I haven't bought it yet. But it, wow, it's just such a pleasure to use. I mean, it's just they've really they've really crushed that that market. And the great thing is having that confidence there that you can see the image and now it's going to go in. Um, it's a it's a really good good setup. Um, next question. Now I have a conundrum. Uh, what clients do you have that will not allow you to show their work on your sizzle reel? And um, by the way, I misread the number of questions, so I was kind of rushing through them and so I pushed us through a little too fast. So if you've got another question or two before the top of the hour, go ahead and throw that in. Um, anyway, uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Now, I have a, a problem. Most of the work that I do uh, is for uh, pharmaceutical organizations, and I'm under NDA. And I've done some really cool stuff graphically and also editing-wise, um, but I can't show it on my sizzle reel, so I don't get a chance to show it off. Um, what do you do, beg? Just do it? I mean, what do you, how do you work around that? I, I, I can't do it because I've signed an agreement that says I can't do it. So yeah. Yeah. it's a conundrum. I, I haven't had a sizzle reel for a long time. <laughs> so that's, that's how I've done it. I, I, have, I, I, made a, uh, I made a demo reel in 1994. It was, and I, it took me a year to build that demo reel because I hadn't, didn't have any work. And so I built the demo reel saying this is what I could do. And I got a, immediately got a job from H, HBO. So it was great. I mean, got a, got a gig from HBO, um, animating some big theater. And, uh, but um, I have not built one since. <laughs> you know, like, so, uh, in, you know, so I haven't had a, I haven't had a sizzle reel uh, since 1994. And uh, um, I think that the thing that, that I, worry about a lot was as I put those together is really number one is repeat clients, you know, clients come back over and over and over again, because the, the product is good. Uh, number two is that um, I, I, I um, people generally are recommend, I'm recommended to other people by the people that I'm working with, oh, you're looking for someone, this is the person to use, or that's the person to use, or whatever that looks like. And so almost everything that I've done in the last 30 years has been almost 30 years has been word of mouth you know, that, that it's just like, this is the person that will figure out the thing, you know? And so I've really relied on that. And the funny thing about sizzle reels is because I don't have one. Um, a lot of times, uh, there's a mystique to the fact that I can't show you anything or tell you anything. I had a client that came in and they, you know, they said, Oh, we, we heard you're the guy that do the thing, do, do these live events, these live interactive events. And, but can you send us a sizzle reel? And I said, no, I, I don't, I, don't ha I can't show you anything. And they said, well, can you give us a list of your clients? And I was like, no, I can't. I can't give you a list of my clients either. And there was a long drawn out thing. And then, and then they, they were, they, well, how do we know if you're good? And I said, well, someone recommend, do you trust them? <laughs> like, like I was like, and if not, you know, I, I completely, and, and the thing is the, the, the kind of the off putting, like, what if it doesn't work for you? I, I completely understand. Um, but, but I can't, I can't divulge any of that information. And then two days later, they, they spent $400,000 with us. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, so, so you just have to, you know, there's a, uh, there is a mystique to not not showing any of those things. The fact that none of it's up there, none of it's shown, you know, there's a kind of a, um, I think a lot of times Rob, you know, um, uh, Hitchcock was very good at this idea that I'll, I'll imply things and necessarily, you know, so if you, if people know that you're the one that did something with the president or know that you're the one that did something with this company or that company from other people, um, then they don't know all the other things that might be there. <laughs> you know, so go ahead, Courtney. 
Yeah, another thing what you can do is, you know, if they hired you to produce something for them that's snazzy and you're proud of, uh, they're probably going to post it somewhere and use it. So just Mm -hmm. put a link to their uh, public exposure of your work and put it in your CV and say, you know, I worked on this for this company if they allow Mm -hmm. you to do that. If it's public facing, they can't really stop you from doing that. Uh, They're trying to drive more people to their website and they would probably appreciate it. And for those of us who don't have, that can't talk about it, a lot of us know each other. And a lot of times what, what happens, what you see there is someone will post things on Twitter and says, I bet this will be a great event, <laughs> you know, or I think I'm really looking forward to this event. That's, those are the kind of things that that's kind of the coded. This is what I'm working on right now. Go ahead, Mitchell. It's a whole different world out here on the East coast. I don't know why, but it is. And, uh, in the Philadelphia region, uh, people protect their resources very carefully I've got a couple of uh, big uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies and agencies that represent them. And um, we have a great relationship, but they don't want to shout to anybody that I'm doing their work for them because uh, uh, they want to have control of that uh, that particular resource. And if it gives them an edge over their competition, uh, it's different. It's just not as uh, fertile a ground here uh, on the east, uh, as it is out where you are, in terms of uh, sharing information and um, you know being heard, uh, and the gatekeepers and the companies that make those decisions have changed from people that know you and know your uh, your talents to um, HR people or accounting people just making decisions based on the big dollarino. Go, go ahead, Nigel. Get to the right person and apply uh, and get to their ego. We do lots of fabulous houses for famous people. And, uh, you know, sometimes they won't let us do photography or videos. But if Architectural Digest comes in, then, oh, they're all really excited to show everything off. The way we've got around that, by the way, is to is to focus less on the marquee or the banner clients are much more on the problems that we've solved for people. So we sort of refocused our, our version of the scissor reel to, hey, if you're building a home and you have these problems, let me show you how we've solved these for other people. And, and it's not quite as sexy, but it's actually more effective. Yeah. And, and I think that you're absolutely right that you just, there is a, we look at oftentimes as well as we work with nonprofits, folks with smaller events and so on and so forth. And I say, we'll give you a, a good deal or sometimes do it pro bono but I get access to all of that to, sh- to show it off. Like if I'm going to put the, you know, I'm going to do this and this is, and then what I can do is do a case study that is, this is how we, you know, we had this problem and we put it all together and we made it all great. And, and this is a, um, this is, and nonprofits are where we really focus a lot on that, um, where we, we do an event for them and then I can build a case study. And usually that's still not even on the website or anywhere else publicly, but I can send something to someone when they ask, how can you do, how would you do this? Well, look at this and look at how this works. And, and, and anytime a client then also says you can show it, you know, a lot of times then I'm showing it to a lot of people, <laughs> you know, friends, but again, it's not on my website. It's not on, it's me sending personal stuff on over LinkedIn or texts or, you know, that kind of thing. I, I'm, I don't show most of what I do publicly. Next question. Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Will IzzyCast run on only Macs or will it also run on Windows and an x86 CPU? You know, I, I actually am not, I'm almost certain that it'll run on everything um, because that's, the, you know, Marcus kind of focused mostly on being able to be cross-platform. So I believe that IzzyCast will be cross-platform. Uh, we do have a reminder that this afternoon, uh, Andy Carlucci will be joining us uh, in after hours to answer questions about Zoom ISO and, uh, and many other things in that realm. So uh, I think it's 3 p.m. I think it's in the schedule that we sent out, but I think it's at uh, 3 p.m. today. Um, yeah, the, he'll be, uh, yeah, 3 p.m. today. He'll be actually at our office answering your questions. <laughs> so, uh, so um, if you have questions about IzzyCast or, or about uh, Zoom ISO uh, or Zoom OSC, uh, definitely join us at 3 o'clock uh, this afternoon. Uh, next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. Chris asks, what is your most looked for thing for streaming that doesn't exist yet? The most looked for thing in streaming um, oh, I, I needed to look at that. I need to think about that a little bit more. Um, I, I know that there's things that we all wish that we had more of, <laughs> but I'm not sure which one those are. Let's go to the next question. Next one from Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. What is the showrunner responsibility span in reference to an office hours live event production? Showrunners typically span multiple episodes of a TV series, but office hour live events are really one-offs. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think a showrunner is really the, the person who is accountable for the for the for the show, and we should bring some showrunners on. I'll see if I can find a good showrunner to come on and talk about it. But it's really their show, you know. They're they are um, in a very much a producer role, um, and um, so it's their show, and they they are putting together. They're working with the story, the story, the process, the you know all those bits and pieces. They're usually the ones that that push the show forward. So, um, but we'll we'll see if we can't get uh, can't get somebody on to talk about that. Okay, we are now changing subjects. We're very excited to have uh, the folks from Q Lab here, uh, Sam and Chris. Hi, Sam. Hi, Chris. How are you guys doing? Uh, we, it's good to see you again. We, we, we've had Q Lab on before, and uh, just to explain what Q Lab was, but uh, now the new, the new Q Lab is out. Um, can you tell us a little bit? I'm not sure who's the best person to talk to. Sam, Sam of course, is the, is the uh, product designer, and Chris is, 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 the, is the CEO. So um, tell us a little bit about what, what, you, what challenges you are really attacking with, with the new version. Sam, I think you should. You think I should? Great, sure. <laughs> well, um, so for uh, for QLab five, we um, we you know we were starting to develop QLab five right as the pandemic hit. So we uh, a lot of our choices had to do with what our focus could entail during um, a change in the entire world and. Uh, cessation of business of all of our customers. And I realize and I realize that that we should back up and talk a little bit about for anyone who hasn't heard about QLab, can you explain how would you explain what QLab does and how you, what what it was designed to do? The most succinct way that I have found to describe QLab is that it is a uh, show control and media playback program for Mac OS designed to suit the needs of live theater and any other event that operates similarly to live theater. So audio playback, video playback, um, DMX Artnet control of lighting equipment, but we also both send and receive uh, show control signals via OSC, MSC, MIDI voice messages, time code, um, both linear time code and dreadful time code, which is what I call MIDI time code. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's designed to sort of uh, operate either as sort of a, a playback platform or mm -hmm. as a show control hub to connect different aspects of live technology, uh, live performance technology together. That's great. So, yeah, and, and it has been, I mean, I, on, on some of the shows that I've worked on, it's the heart of what's happening on the on stage. You know, like it, it is something that, you know, there's there's just all those cues, you know, and, you know, when we got into it, the first thing that we did is we were using it to replace Playback Pro. And it was like the other thing that wasn't very expensive that we could do that with. And then we just started digging into all these other tools that were that were available that really can tie into almost everything in the theater. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So, so to get so that kind of gives people an introduction a little bit to what QLab does. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about again, we'll go back to what what, uh, what's new in 5.0. So uh, we dialed into sort of a few key sets of um, functionality that we really wanted to put our attention on. The main one was video. We rebuilt our video engine from scratch to support Apple's Metal framework. Um, Metal. And how, replaces... and how has that changed things? Well, You're right. Going... So Metal, was, uh, when Apple invented Metal, um, they sort of opened the door to essentially much better performance and also opened the door to um, making it trivial for QLab to leverage whatever new advantage um, comes along from uh, Apple's hardware advances. So when they build a new chip, the M1 and the M2 series, those chips have built in um, hardware components that decode video or ease um, any kind of a lot of video functions. And we get that access to that for free by virtue of using metal. So the performance of video in QLab 5 is much better than that of QLab 4 on an equal computer, even though it does more. And how much and how would you measure that when, when you say the performance is better? What is it? What does that mean? Well, this is something that uh, tends to drive a lot of people up the wall when we talk about QLab's performance, because QLab is so flexible, because we designed it to not assume what you're going to use it for it's really difficult to give absolute terms mm -hmm. um it can be used on any mac that runs mac os 10 uh, mac os 11 or newer so some folks might be running it on a tricked out mac pro that cost them thirty thousand dollars and those folks are going to get um, eight 
to 10 HD outputs, maybe six 4K outputs, and be able to run multiple queues on each at the same time. I think we've tested on a Mac Studio with an M1 Ultra. We've tested uh, 32 simultaneous 60 frames per second HD videos. I think I got. I think I got more than that. The thing, the the, the thing that was wild about this transition was that uh, when we did our started doing our initial performance tests of the new video engine, we had to change our tests uh, mm -hmm. because when we were running tests on on the Apple Silicon the change from OpenGL to Metal, specifically on Silicon. It performs mm -hmm. better on Intel as well, but but they really set themselves up to just go crazy on, so, on their mm -hmm. own hardware. So when we were doing our initial tests, we actually initially thought we were doing the test wrong because it was we were hitting the limits that we were used to starting to see performance problems, and it was just sort of breezing right past them. So it, it, it was a significant update. Yeah. And, and those, for those watching, of course, what would you do with all those screens? These are all different screen. You, you can be putting out when you say eight, 10 ADP streams, people are going to ask like, why would you need eight? What, what are people using those for? So in live theater, uh, it sort of works a little differently than in broadcast mindset wise, <clears throat> because uh, in live theater, it's common to have uh, a number of outputs that represent different physical spaces on stage. Um, mm -hmm. I'm about to work on a on a Broadway show that has, I believe, uh, it has a three video walls at three depths on the stage, and it has eight projectors on the balcony rail, painting, uh, painting sort of four distinct areas of the stage from the front. So each of those outputs needs to be individually addressable, so that. Uh, you can start to think of video output much more like the way a lighting designer thinks about coverage from their lighting instruments. Right. The other, and one other factor there is that because uh, some of the video performance that you might want to care about are things like live effects, um, because so much of what QLab does can't be baked in ahead of time, it needs to respond to the timing of something on stage. Uh, if you need to apply an effect or have it applied dynamically in re reaction to something that's happening live. Uh, you can't bake it into the file. And so the video performance comes into play there that now we have multiple effects and m more of them can run at the same time. And, uh, and that, you know, even if you only have one or two projected outputs, uh, you may want to layer a ton of effects on them. So that comes into play as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is interesting. Everyone we've talked to that's been working with, uh, the new, the new M1s and M2s just are just, they have a hard time describing. And I know that even, you know, like, like there's just so much data coming out of them, out, out of those, those pieces. They seem to have, um, taken kind of an exponential jump forward. Um, and, and, uh, so you've seen the same thing as far as, and that's not just video playback, but also layering and graphics. It's mind blowing. Yeah, completely yeah. astonishing. Yeah, uh, it, it feels to me it feels like you know QLab has always uh, there's always been plenty of headroom for most audio playback. You mm -hmm. could uh, QLab t t was it was easy for sound designers to go and throw a bunch of files, not be too worried about how much they were stressing the CPU until they were really starting to put lots of effects or tons of files at the same time. They could just kind of not worry about it. Video, you always had to worry about it. You always had to right. be thinking like, how many do I have playing? How many pixels am I running? And we're with this change, if you have a Mac Studio, you can play in a, in a range where it's just, you stop thinking about it so much. You just throw a bunch of files on, you throw effects, whatever. It's just, it's just doing it. You don't have, you're not, you're not worried about where you are relative to your headroom of the CPU, which is just wild. That's great. And ultimately what we found is that the, um, the, the, there's, there is a threshold where when you stop worrying about the technical limitations of your tool, uh, the kinds of design possibilities that become uh, realizable mm -hmm. are not uh, it, it changes the possibilities in the mind of the designer when they're not thinking about managing the tool yeah. and so that's why it's exciting to me it's the technical capabilities interesting in and of itself certainly but the fact that it sort of pushes away that whole category of concern means it unshackles the designer to start thinking creatively in a way that they previously just had to box themselves in now, when you're talking about that many outputs, how are you, how is QLab, what is QLab addressing? Where is it sending those outputs out of? Is it, is it NDI, SDI, HDMI? How does, how, how do you get to that many screens? So uh, starting with QLab 5, we support NDI, uh, NDI 5, mm -hmm. 5 point, I don't remember what, mm -hmm. NDI 5 is built right into QLab and mm -hmm. that is a great option. Um, that's how I'm coming to you today. You're seeing my camera through QLab output via NDI into mm -hmm this show um just 
because I can, because it's fun. Yeah, exactly. Um, but QLab also, so QLab will let video come out through the native uh, built-in video outputs on a Mac, which um, depending upon what Mac you have, that may be w between one and six. Mm -hmm. uh, QLab will also use Siphon out if you use another piece of software in the pipeline uh, between QLab and your outputs. And then QLab has built-in support for Blackmagic hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're using... Um, uh, deck link cards or ultra studio boxes. Uh, I generally prefer deck link cards these days. So, and, and so if you had, let's say, um, you know, th uh, one of those uh, sonnet boxes that holds three and you put three of those in, you'd have, you could potentially have 24 outputs, you know, that are available to you from there. And is there enough bandwidth to do that through the Thunderbolt? That's so my, off the top of my head. I think that Thunderbolt three versus three deck link quad mm -hmm. cards in a sonnet that that sounds like it's stretching it to me yeah but because most macs have two thunderbolt buses right. um, my laptop for example the two sides of the mac the left and the right side are two buses so if you had two thunderbolt chassis yep. two sonnet boxes and put one card in each i think you yeah, should have 16. no trouble that's great so what else is new what, what else is new in 5.0 uh, we rebuilt our patching system. I know this is not very glamorous, but it's really useful. Mm -hmm. um, patches, uh, which are sort of the back end way of connecting what your cues send to what your hardware receives. Um, the patching system has been rebuilt. It's more modular. It's more flexible. You can drag and drop patches between workspaces. So if you build up a show and you're really pleased with your structure, it's really easy to get all that structure into another show and start start right. fresh with your same backend structure. We've also added a huge amount of um, functionality to our OSC library. So QLab is dramatically more remote controllable than it used to be. And building on that, even more excitingly, is we've added a layer uh, to QLab, which we call QLab Collaboration, which allows multiple people on a local network to use multiple copies of QLab to collaborate on a single workspace. That's great. So I can work on these queues over here. You work on those queues over there. And um, and everything you and I both do is live in real time. It sort of puts QLab into a client server model uh, right. and makes it makes it easier to apply the the brain power of multiple humans to one one QLab project at the same time. That's great. Yeah, and it's you know it's sometimes those things that are not as quote unquote sexy as as something that everyone sees is really something that that makes a huge difference for the people that are using it every day, you know, and and have to, you know, get over that little hump there. So that's that's fantastic. We've got a bunch of questions rolling in. I think we might jump to a couple of them and see see what we have here. Go ahead. Uh, let's um, jump into the first question. And it's from Talalek Miguel Lopez Waterman in Knoxville, Tennessee. Is the new native integration of NDI, NDI4, NDI5, or both? Uh, we're using NDI5. Right. So not not any other NDI, just just NDI five is the is the output. Yeah, our my best understanding is that uh, from a software perspective, integrating multiple forms of multiple versions of NDI is uh, is a juice that's not worth the squeeze. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question, and it's from Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada, and right here on the panel, Chris, can you tell us a bit of a background of how you came to create QLab and the path to creating an industry standard app? Sure, sure. Um, when was it? When was when? When did you create QLab? It was about oh boy, it was about seventeen or eighteen years ago. Now I always have to look it up. I I have a bad mind for dates, so I have a little text file on my computer where when people ask me that, I go frantically open it to to remember what the dates were. But uh, it was about seventeen years ago. Um, I was uh, originally, very originally, I was in grad school at the time, uh, and I was in computer science grad school, but I was, uh, I was kind of having, not enjoying myself that much. I wasn't enjoying my research and wanted to do something that I enjoyed working on. I had, pr prior to grad school, just been in an apprentice program as an actor at Actors Theatre of Louisville, and I had some friends who had moved to the same state I was in. They were starting a little company, and they uh, were going to do a show. And they needed something more sophisticated than would work for with on a CD player. And they asked me uh, for help. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I think we had Google back then. So I said, I'll, I'll, I'll Google something for you, but didn't, didn't find a whole lot on a Mac, which is what they had. Uh, they had a Mac, but they didn't have money for anything else. Uh, so I and a couple other friends decided um, to take a shot at building something for them in a very compressed period of time. It was a matter of weeks, not months. So did you have a programming background when you 
jumped into it? I, I mean, I, my, I had a double major in computer science and theater from undergrad, but that's a different thing from having a programming background. You yeah, know, yeah. I mean, when I started, I had not written a program. I had not written a real program. Uh, right. It was, it was learning core audio from scratch. It was learning Objective C from scratch. It was, yeah. it was just one of those. It, it, it's one of those. Um, if you realize how hard it's going to be, you wouldn't have started kind of right. situations, which are all the most worthwhile things are. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, if you knew, if you knew, you might not have done it. Um, <laughs> so, so in a very compressed period of time, uh, we whipped out this this tiny little program, which, uh, if if you look at screenshots now, it, it is recognizably similar to the thing it became. Uh, that hap- that happened. That little group of of friends disbanded. Uh, and time moved on, but I, I had enjoyed it so much that I picked it up back up again a few months later and thought, I'm just, I don't know, I'm going to keep working on it. We'll see if it's useful to anyone. Uh, I just b- sort of felt obsessed with it because it felt like there was something there to, that I wanted to see. I wanted to see what it would look like when it was real and done. Um, worked on it for a number of months, uh, shared it with the sound designer mailing list, got a lot of positive feedback, and it was kind of kind of from there, just, you know, lots of nights and weekends, eventually quit, quit my day job, uh, was working from home. There was a, there was a funny a story that I like to tell when I was, you know, working from home in my apartment, this was still just me at the time. There were a number of years that I was doing everything and, uh, I was obsessed with writing back to people when they had questions or had problems with the program and try to, you know, email them back and do all the support. And I got, I went, I got one great email. They wrote in with a bug. I wrote back very quickly and they, they wrote back to say, Chris, I am so glad I got you. I heard you're the guy to talk to. About. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what you think is going on here. Cause there's, it's just me in my, my living room. So, I am yeah, the guy. I am the guy. There's nobody else. <laughs> so, well, I guess you heard right. You yeah, heard exactly. right. But yeah, you got me. Um, now, of course, it's a it's a team of experts, uh, much more than just me. There's this this is no longer a one person show by any means. Um, mm-hmm. And in fact, I I have to encourage people not to contact me directly uh, when they need help because I, there are now people like Sam and a whole crew of people who are much better at it than me. So it slows them down if they try to ask me because I often don't know the answer. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a very much a solving solving problem for a friend. Uh, solving a problem in an industry those that are, I understood. Those are yeah. oftentimes the best ones. You know, that, yeah. that, the, 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 the best uh, things are when you're actually solving a real problem and putting it together. Now, how many have you had to at any point stop and just rewrite it or restart it or rebuild it? You know, or do you do it in pieces? In pieces. Like with video. Yeah, in pieces. Um, it's never been, uh, it's never been the whole, the whole caboodle. Um, that one of the interesting things about, uh, working on it for such a long period of time and b- becoming a better programmer over time, frankly, is that the stuff that you do when you're starting out, uh, you reach for a li- you know, you reach for an audio library because someone smarter than you has written something that does a good job. And then over time you realize, actually, I can write a better version of this and it'll be better also because I understand how it works. And so, you know, you go in and take some chunks that you leaned on early on and replace right. them with stuff that you write yourself, that we write in house. So over time we'll take chunks of it the video engine is a great example. That was all our work, but we learned a ton uh, from doing it. And we're, when we were able to start uh, clean the second time, it gave us a chance to to really transform how the architecture was designed uh, for the long haul. So, no, absolutely, yeah. I, and and where did, where did you see it suddenly take off? Was there a point, or was it just a gradual uh, slope up, or was there any kind of hockey stick? It's never been a hockey stick, thank goodness. Uh, right. You know, we're a small company in a relatively small market. Uh, if if we had a, a larger, you know, theater is a very healthy market for us, but mm-hmm. we're less than 20 people. Um, if it were a whole lot bigger, I'd be worried because I'd be watching, you know, Apple keynote speeches wondering when they were going to introduce the thing that was going to kill us. But I'm not worried about that because I don't think it's quite big enough of a market for an Adobe or an Apple to to invest their kind of attention in right um so it's it's never you know it we it's it's been a gradual bootstrapped we have no outside investment it's been a Mm self-funded kind of thing so it's been gradual over time just that steady tick of you know get feedback make improvements make the next release do it iteratively do it quick as quickly as we can um and just kind of build as we go along i do i do you know there were moments um there were moments when 
we would look at each other and go, man, that, that just felt like that kicked up a notch, you know, where they, you know, used it on the Olympic opening ceremonies and, you know, right. it's an audience of 7 billion people and you go, holy cow. Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and, you know, the, the, I, for me, it was about, uh, it, it became, uh, I became conscious about 2013, 2014. We, a lot of us in, in just regular events, not theater, were using Playback Pro and they had, they had really written their own engine, which allowed us to do a lot of things that were um, not possible on the Mac otherwise. And so a lot of us had used it. The problem was, is that what got them there was also the thing that, that made it difficult as things moved forward, which was that they had written their own engine <laughs> and it, it was becoming less and less stable. So mm -hmm. suddenly all of us were trying to find something else. And I remember I had a, uh, someone working for me is, oh, you got to check out this thing, this Q Lab, And I was like, oh, it's really complicated. And, and I was like, and I looked at it and I said, it can play two things at one time, which terrified me, you know? So I was like, yeah, oh, I don't yeah. know. You know, like, like, cause, cause we were always afraid of the two things right. playing out to a, you know, to a thing. And then, and then I was actually in Africa and uh, we, were, we were running an event for the World Bank and, and the, um, uh, and, uh, and they were all, the whole thing was all run on Q Lab, And I was like, okay, now I got to pay attention. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. it was, it was a, and they, they just had that thing dialed all the way in. So that's when I started to see it. And then I said, I, 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 the reason I ask is that in that 2013, 2014, it went from, I had never heard of it to, I saw it behind almost every show and we were using it on, you know, pretty big events. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so saw, it was, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I think we saw, um, I think we saw a, a pretty good uptick towards sort of the middle to end of the life cycle of QLab 3 as we were ramping up to building QLab 4. Yeah. Because QLab 3 took a big step forward um, in, in flexibility and in power. And QLab 3 also incorporated a lot of specific feedback from some industry leaders in theater. So the kinds of things that folks were really hoping for ended up exactly exactly what they wanted ended up on their under their fingertips. So um, and then we we sort of had a a, a coincidental overlap with sort of a, a good run of Apple hardware at that time. Right. So when they came out with a couple of good, really good Macs, it was right when folks were looking for something uh, to run QLab on that would perform better. And that was fortunate. I think that it's it definitely, uh, the, 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 for the folks that have gone Mac only and really written directly to it, the, the payoff in the last couple of years has been been pretty good. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, yeah, I know lucky a lot of folks. Yes. Lucky yes. I mean, you know, it was, it was hard because it, it really felt like we were moving. I thought before the M1 came out, I really thought that there'd be a point where I wouldn't be using Macs for production, you know, because I just didn't think they were going to be powerful enough. I thought Apple, and when they announced the M1, I thought that was going to go backwards. They were going to go towards mm -hmm. the consumer and I wasn't going to, and it just went the other way. Yeah, I mean, I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's funny, uh, in terms of things we've added in version five, we actually added some stuff directly to your your original concern when you first saw it of, uh, you know, tools to make it easier to create playlists of things that don't overlap each other, you know, because it is it is so common now for people to need to throw in some slides or throw in, have, you know, playlists. And, and so we have a whole set of features around uh around building that quickly and easily and with minimal fuss, which I'm pretty excited about. So yeah, we're, we're, great. we're, we're finally getting to, we're getting sophisticated enough that, to play only one thing at a time. <laughs> it was, it was definitely one of those things. Like it, it took me years to use it because of that one thing. I was like, Oh, something's going to play. We're going to hear the audio, but only yeah. see the video and it's going to be bad, you know? And so, yeah. um, it's great. It's fantastic. Uh, we have a, a linear key effect, which I, I considered asking uh, the team if we wanted to call it the, the Alex Lindsay key, but, uh, I decided that we should just call it linear key. Most linear folks don't key. know what that means. <laughs> and and our, in Sam's last uh, visit with you, you were talking about a linear key effect, yeah. and we we saved us like I think I rec I screen captured the video so that and then like transcribed it your description of it. And we put oh. it in the GitHub issue, so we were doing very <laughs> exactly. close following your notes when we were implementing that. Yeah, that's good. And and I, one question, um, one of one of my other requests in the past was, uh, ten, are you supporting ten bit video or is it still eight bit? Not yet, but it is on in the plans. We very, very much want to support 10 bit. It was one of the things we looked at and and it was just enough work to, you yeah. know, it's not we can't flip a switch. Um right. so it's absolutely something we want to do. We're not quite we we have we did make some improvements about how HDR uh video plays back in 8 bit. So it, it right. uh in, at least in many cases it, it looks a lot better than in version four, but it's not fully 10 bit yet. Yeah, absolutely. No, let's go to the next question. 
And it's from Tlaalik, Miguel Lopez Waterman in Knoxville, Tennessee. Does the new EOS family OSC integration allow OSC to allow OSC to work a little more like MSC with a Q control? Oh, there's a deep one. <laughs> That's a great um, question. Yeah. Was, it might is have a done question. a little bit of theater work. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So it's a, it's a mixed bag, right? Because um, a lot of theater folks, especially folks who are accustomed to using ETC, are... Um, uh, I, I say this with love and nothing but admiration and respect for ETC, but the EOS family implements MSC incorrectly. Now, I believe they do that on purpose. They make a, a choice to break spec, and I think that it's it's not a bad choice. I understand why they're doing it. The MSC spec clearly states you're supposed to send each message explicitly. You're never supposed to just fire hose MSC messages. But when you turn MSC broadcast on on an EOS console, every queue you run an MSC message goes with it. That is, strictly speaking, in violation of the MSC spec, but you can see why you want to do it. You're just moving quick. I'm going to send my cues. I want your cues to match. Bing, bang, boom. So sometimes um, people ask us to have it work the other way. When QLab runs a queue, they just want to be able to broadcast that queue number out. Um, we are reticent to break the spec, um, having um, not quite as many years as EOS in um, as a, an established leader. Um, so the, 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 the system that we devised for OSC is rather in lieu of that. The idea was if we make it much, much easier to make a single queue that does exactly what you want to go trigger the EOS console, then it's not such a heartbreak that it doesn't happen automatically because each individual queue can be made in one-tenth the time it used to be. So that's our philosophy for the moment. And That's I will crazy. say that we are interested in uh, adding a feature to allow the broadcast mode or the big you know, red button. Yeah, right, right, right. No, that, right. because it is useful. Um, right. It's just we'll, we'll get there, but we're not there yet. Next question. Next one in from Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Peter asks, when using QLab to manage playout, is there an output that can be observed to let other systems detect when playout has finished and know how much more playout time remains? Hmm. Uh, are we talking in my, video? Or are we talking audio? Yeah. Are we talking both? I this is the sort of question that I want more details about. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I think that one of the things that um, I think the question there is really knowing that it, that it's happening and that there's time. What what the TRT is, you know, um, uh, you know the. I think that that is a challenge. All, oftentimes, is that is that sent out as data or is there a window that would give you it'd be really cool to have a window that had all the like all the things that are happening right now so this um, is a, ch a constant challenge for us um a, a very pleasant challenge is that um different folks use qlab in wildly different ways and some folks have built-in assumptions about um you know uh they say you know why can't qlab just broadcast the current queue well when i'm designing a show um uh off-broadway theatrical um, a straight play or a musical, uh, it's rare that there's only one cue going at a time. For me, a normal mm -hmm. scene contains 10 to 12 cues simultaneously at right. all times. So what's the current cue? It doesn't mean anything to me. But for another person, for someone in a broadcast environment, such as yourself, the idea of more than one cue playing is a terrible idea. It's a horrifying idea. And for good reason. So each context is different. And the purpose that QLab tries uh, to to put forward is my purpose is to be whatever you need me to be. So right. the quick answer is no, but the long answer is there are tools you can build yourself within QLab to do that. For instance, there is the ability to broadcast the uh, time remaining of a particular queue or uh, the time remaining of all currently running queues. You can broadcast that either as an integer value or as a percentage value. Um, and so that information is gettable. It's just not there on the on the face. That makes sense. So you and can then, build something that would hear it and then it would just display it for you. Exactly so. And there are, um, you know, there are some, some uh, for the person, at, the operator at the actual machine, there are, of course, displays of how many queues yeah. are running, how far along they are, how how much time until each queue is ending. Sometimes that might be, as Sam says, that might be 30, 40, 50, 60 queues at a time, but it will have a list of all of them. Um, we added monitor windows to V5 so that you can have a confidence monitor for any video output in the system, which wasn't in V4. So there's there are tools um, to have a sense of what's happening, but it's it's true that it is it is a little bit 
uh, tricky to then fit the theatrical mindset into the broadcast mindset in some ways. And there has to be some stitching that happens there. Next question. Palalik is back with a question. What kind of utilization was envisioned for the QLab Zoom OSC integration in QLab? Uh, long and short, folks use QLab with Zoom to do what a lot of folks call digital theater or virtual theater or whatever you want to name it. It's not, it's got many different names and it is a weirdly contentious subject. I don't understand why it's contentious. Make art. If people watch it and like it, then it's good art. The end is how I feel. So anyway, uh, folks use QLab for playback uh, in a digital theater, online theater environment. Zoom is by far the most popular platform um, for digital theater. And Zoom OSC is a really fabulous tool for allowing the Zoom application itself to be remote controllable in a very sort of precise and specific way. So it's a natural evolution for us. Uh, QLab speaks OSC. Zoom OSC wants to use OSC to remote control Zoom. So why not make a template for that to make queue making as easy as possible? The whole queue, uh, queue template system for network queues that is new in V5. The idea is simply, um, wouldn't it be nice to not have to go to the manual and look up a list of commands to make sure that you're making your OSC messages correctly? Because each application or device that supports OSC has its own library of commands. That's the whole point of OSC. So QLab just has a bunch of them built in. And when people write to us and say, I use this app or I use this device with QLab all the time, then it goes on the list of ones that are going to get built into the network template system. And this, and this is something that really exploded between four and five, right? I mean, this is the, you know, this, this, this entire market. Yeah, it's it's awfully fun. And th there's, you know, we can extend it even more because the, it, secretly, this is just JSON definitions for these libraries for these network things. Right. Uh, and uh, we can do things like, um, so this building that I'm standing in, which is a theater, which is our like research theater, basically, uh, we wrote a uh, JSON library of the commands for the building. So now QLab in this building will show a UI that's custom and specific to this building to turn on the work lights, turn off the work lights, to change the routing uh, of the audio to the lobby or to the stage. So there's a bunch. So we have this ever increasing list of commands that control actually directly controls the building that all of the Macs only in this building can offer the designers to manipulate it, which is pretty fun. Absolutely. Next question. From Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada. What's next for QLab and Figure 53? And can you talk a bit about the Voxel? What's next? What's next? That's a great question, which we're just constantly trying to answer ourselves every morning. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, when you when you have a small company that works in this iterative fashion, a lot of what's next uh, ends up being directed by what we hear from people on a day to day basis. We don't, you know, we don't have, um, we, we have our own, we have our own plans and goals. We know there's things we want to work on. We are reluctant to talk about them too publicly because then when plans change, people get disappointed. Um, so, so we, we have a lot of things we want to keep adding to V5. Uh, we have a bunch of stuff on our list that we want to add into 5.1, 5.2. Um, that's sort of our tradition is that we, we start somewhere and then keep iterating within that major version. Um, and I don't know, I don't know if I should get too much into the details of that. Um, but I think it is fair to say if you are a QLab user and you have a specific pet feature that you want to see in QLab writing to us and explaining not only what it is, but why you'll use it, how you'll use it, how you can't do it now. And so what the limitation that you're facing is and what is the artistic result of your plans once that feature were to be implemented, that's what really fires us up. That's what's going to make it more likely for it to creep upwards on that list which is a long list. It's about 1500 items right now. But it, 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 oh, go ahead, go ahead. So, no, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, it, it does point to, you know, I was talking before about how excited we got about Alex's description of Linear Keen and why it was important to him and the details of it and why it was exciting and what, how it was, you know, the more, and that's why, and, and to tie it into the question about the theater, this is, we call it the voxel, uh, which is, it's just the computer term for essentially three-dimensional pixel, which felt like a good name for a black box theater, a physical, physicalized uh, cross section of our computer life here. Um and and that's one of the reasons that this place exists is because the more that we really connect and deeply understand the 
the what's driving the problem solve, you know, the problems people have, how they're trying to solve them now and how we could help solve them easier. Um, it, it's the clear we the clear sight we have into that, the more it motivates us to go, oh yeah, I could add this little bit of code. That would you know, if it's not an abstracted thing, it really fires us up to to get that problem solved and out in the world. Can you can you explain about when you said this place? What can you explain this place? So this place behind me, so this is a, about an eight thousand square foot theater uh in Baltimore. Uh, it, it happened just coincidentally to be behind our old office, which now is ever since the pandemic started, we've basically <laughs> retired the office. We went full time remote, but we still have the theater. Uh, it is it was an old movie theater that had fallen into disrepair. Um, I worked many years, about 10 years on on a vision of trying to build up a, a, a black box theater that could be a place for teaching QLab classes, doing research and development and then hosting artists and have having an artistic component. Uh, so this is the space that uh, was completed just in January 2020, just before the pandemic started, which was which is which is harsh. just the worst potential <laughs> time. I mean, it was just really harsh. You know, we did one show. Yeah, the pandemic hit, shut it all down for a year and a half. But it's we're we're coming back to life, um, and it is uh, really I, I I like to think that it's about as good a, a setup for for example classes. We're going to start doing regular classes here every year. Sam uh, is a fantastic teacher. He will be teaching uh, two or three times a year. We expect uh, to you know, anywhere from 50 to 80 people, however, choose to come. Um, we'll have a several days of classes in, in kind of like the perfect environment uh, for, you know, we have a 10 channel D&B surround audio system stationed around the stage. And um, it, it's just, it's just how, a real fun place to learn. How big is the stage? Oh gosh. Um, it's about a, it's a, roughly speaking, it's about a hundred seat black box. You know, we could probably cram in 120 um, if we really wanted to, but, uh, it's, I don't know, square feet off the top yeah. of my head. It sounds um, really cool. It's fun. It's fun. It's, it's, it's in some ways it's somewhat simple. It's, you know, it's like a big empty black box space. Um, yep. but that's kind of, I don't know. I like, I like that vibe. Well, I, you a know, lot we, of pay, flexibility. We, we, we think a lot about broadcasting from those kind of places because mm -hmm. I mean, we don't need a lot of people. In fact, we don't often want any people <laughs> in, in the room, you know, and, and being, you know, and being able to, um, you know, one of the things we really think a lot about is how to, how to get not only to people watching at home, but to other venues, you know, so that you can have multiple experiences at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, I, one of the things I would like to work on here is, is building up our, our live streaming muscles, uh, to, to have a proper, you know, studio and, and production room. Uh, if only you space. knew people who were into live yeah. streaming. That's all I gotta I say. Yeah, just <laughs> let us know. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> all right. Uh, next, next question. Dave Chalmers from Glasgow, Scotland. Scotland. Is there a way in QLab to create functions or macros that will fire multiple commands with a single command in the Q list, more than just keep nesting in a group? Well, Maybe. I guess. I guess my answer to that respectfully is nesting cues in a group does do multiple things with a single keystroke. So I'm not really sure what that is lacking for you. Um, something that I think uh, a big aha moment for a lot of QLab users when I am teaching classes is the way that I use hotkeys. So on my uh, keyboard, uh, when I am... Um, when I'm programming QLab, I sort of reserve the control key as the modifier key uh, for QLab specific commands. And then I have scripts, OSC messages, and group queues containing multiple scripts or multiple OSC messages. And then I give a hotkey uh, trigger to those group queues or to those script queues that starts with control. So control I, for example, runs my special script that takes all the selected cues and builds a set of fade ins for those cues. And um, because control I is the hotkey for that script, it runs the script when I hit that hotkey. And because it, the script is able to query QLab and say, hey, tell me what's selected. Uh, then the script says, okay, everything that's selected, take its current level uh, and its current opacity for video. And save those, make fades that fade to those values, and then go back to the original queue and silence it and fade it all the way out opacity-wise. So that's sort of a way of building a function that extends the power of QLab. And from my perspective, from my finger memory perspective, it's just the same thing as hitting any other keyboard shortcut. 
Um, but my little pinky over here on the control key has become sort of a physical habit when I'm sitting in front of QLab. That pinky creeps down and it's just ready to go. Um, so for me, um, that's the way I think about these things. And that's the way I encourage you to explore thinking about these things. Next question. And it's from Hasma Gajar in Cape Town, South Africa. Lauren Strobe uh, introduced QLab to me and I purchased it in September 2020. I used for video. What is my upgrade path and are you supporting companion through OSC? Thank you for um, the support, first of all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the best way to get really good and specific answers about uh, what, you know, upgrade pricing is to write us at support at figure53.com. Uh, if if you have a V4 license, uh, there we have a lot. We have a what I think is a, a pretty generous uh, upgrade uh, credits associated with those license. Uh, if you bought if you bought a QLab4 license anytime after November of last year, you get every dollar you spent on QLab4, you can apply to QLab5, and then there's like a slightly uh, discounted amount if you purchase before then. Um, but yeah, writing to support is is the best way to get. A real clear answer on what your upgrade options are. Next question. And next question in from Mitchell Hill in Wilmington, Delaware. What would you suggest as a control surface that works with QLab? It depends on what you're trying to control. Um, there are a number of possibilities. If you're trying to simply have a set of buttons that do specific actions, play, stop, back, next, etc. Um, uh, any device that speaks MIDI will do. So uh, some folks use MIDI drum pads very cheerfully. Some folks use the um, sort of general purpose buttons on a MIDI piano. Um, uh, I myself have a sort of side gig building MIDI go button boxes for QLab that are built to communicate to two Macs at the same time. A lot of folks use stream decks. I use a stream deck. I love the stream deck in all ways, except for the sensation of pressing those buttons, which doesn't give me um, from my days of uh, being a theater operator, doesn't give me the sensation of certainty that I've pressed that button correctly. Um, but it's a great they, tool. They, they so could build a pro version of that, that the people would pay $200 more for, for real buttons. It's, like, it's the main reason away. I don't use it. I don't use it. I do it. I use it at home and I use it for things for post. I don't use them in live. And I know a lot of people that do, but I don't use them in live environments because I don't like the buttons. Like it's literally just the buttons that keep me from, from uh, trusting. Yeah. It. And I've, I've torn one apart and I see the way that they balance the button cap on top of the little OLED and yet still have space for the, for the mm -hmm. pressing part of the button. And I don't envy them. It seems like a complicated problem, but it just seems like it's, it's two inches away from a real solid performer. They could just go the extra two inches. I mean, I, I'd be happy just to label them <laughs> and just have big, big movement. I've thought about pulling them all out and putting on new ones in. Like I, I'll just put a, sticker on it and tells me what it is and and i know that that's very unstream stream tech, but, <laughs> but like i you know my, my whole thing is, is that i just i just want more movement you know because i just don't i don't trust it yeah um good mitchell i have a hyper deck uh from black magic design love the big shuttle wheel on it love the very uh precise buttons that are on it but it can't manage play playlist. It can't do all the things that QLabs does. So I would be uh, interested in something that's broadcast oriented. It allows me to cue a nice weighted uh, shuttle wheel and that big red button that you want to hit to go. Yeah, that that really sounds great. Um, and there's it's also an economic question. Um, the um, if the main target market of QLab is theater, and that generally mm -hmm. seems to be so. Um, we've really sort of aimed ourselves at a, an industry that sort of is legendarily poor. And the idea of building uh, hardware that is really top tier, really robust, and, um, you know, really high quality in support of this software that is used only by an industry that generally doesn't have a ton of money, it makes it difficult to find the right economic balance to make something quality and, um, and easily accessible and, and widely distributable and yet still affordable by the same folks who tend to buy QLab. And, and I think that I think that something like JL Cooper probably makes the interfaces that we want to use. It's just a matter of finding the interface, finding the how for a JL Cooper uh, panel to talk to QLab, I think is probably the answer. Because then you get all the high quality stuff and you pay for it. <laughs> it's really expensive. But, but you could 
Yeah, go ahead. I know I was just thinking that part of the story there would be for us to sit down and then talk with you more about, okay, when you have, when you're imagining controlling that knob, what is it that you're controlling? When is the, you know, the details mm -hmm. of which part of the program are you controlling to make sure right. that we could map those things to what you're uh, imagining, you know? Do, do you know, do you take hype, um, the, do you follow the hyperdeck protocol from black magic? Have you explored I that at all? Not. I do not. It's, I am, it's something that is pretty useful for us because um, what it means is any piece of software that will listen as a hyperdeck. So they'll identify themselves. Like so, so for instance, Softron on the air identifies itself as a hyper as um, a hyperdeck. And so now when I'm in my console uh, on my, you know, I'm switching a show, I can just hit a button on my, on like I can see it, I can pick things and I can hit a button. It's not playing from a hyperdeck, it's playing from software. And it's uh, pretty important. <laughs> Because, you know, because there's, there's a lot of limitations to the, the, um, the hyperdecks themselves, like loading files onto a hyperdeck, especially files with multiple, like I, I have files that I put out for live streams and we might have all the different languages that have to play out into multiple streams. And so we, we end up with, um, you know, 37 tracks of audio that are there and I have to play those all out of Dante and, and I can't do that on a hyperdeck. <laughs> so, so I need software that I can, that I can um, activate. But what's really nice is if you're a, if you're a technical director cutting the show, you can, you want to be able to, um, if I'm a technical director that, that, that cutting the show, I don't, I can't look at another piece of interface. I need to be able to just tap on something. And, and usually that's the way it works when a, with a black magic is that if I hit, if I just go to that source, so I say, I'm going to cut to three, it automatically starts playing. You know, so it's it's talking to that. I'm sure that they could, we could build an interface that would talk to it the way it is now and just listen to it and send it over. But soft, some more and more software is starting to listen as a hyperdeck so that I, because then I don't have to hit play. I just hit, I just go to the source. And when I go off the source, it stops. So anyway, it's something to think about. That's my next request. I get one, re yeah. I get one yeah. request. To, one per show. <laughs> per, per show, yeah, exactly. All right. So to clarify, you're saying, you're, you're imagining that if, if QLab were to self-identify as hyperdeck controllable, mm -hmm. then anything that speaks to a hyperdeck could speak to QLab. That's correct. Anything that, that speaks to... really interesting. And that and seems... Most, yeah, go ahead. I just, that seems like... That seems like... Um, it takes away the sort of mystery, yeah. the mysterious layer that people are like, what does this button do? What should this button do? How should this behave? Because yeah. it sounds like you have a sort of predefined protocol that has expected behavior. It's easy yep. for us to wrap our heads around it. And the biggest thing is every person who owns one of these A10 minis um, <laughs> would be able to uh, just go to, go to, you know, input three, which is QLab, and it would automatically play. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. So be, you know, that would be, um, that would be pretty, uh, we're getting a great demo here from Mitchell. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Mitchell. Yeah, yeah. There, go ahead, Mitchell, real quick. Yeah, just just showing you guys uh, the fact that I've got everything right there, and it's just muscle memory. You're hitting those buttons that are very yeah. purpose built to shuttle. That could shuttle through a playlist. It could shuttle through the files when you're setting them up, and you just hit that play button, and off it goes. That's that's the great thing about yeah. a hardware based device. Anyway, next question. Next question is from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, his question is, do nonprofits qualify for the educational discount? We've got a local nonprofit children's theater that I'm hoping to add teaching them digital theater design. Thank you for uh, the question. In short, the answer is, um, if you are an educational environment, you qualify for the educational discount. Basically, anyone who's using QLab in a context in which they are teaching either QLab specifically or theatrical design in general with QLab as a component, um, uh, or anyone who is currently engaged as a, as a full-time student doing those things can receive the educational discount. We don't provide the discount to not-for-profits writ large. Most of our customers are not-for-profits, and so our base price is set as low as it can be uh, while still meeting our economic needs um, with the understanding that we, we understand that not-for-profits don't have a ton of money and we try to make it as affordable as we can. Educational discounts are really specifically for educational environments. We also have uh, something that is fairly unique, although some other companies are adopting it now, we've seen. Uh, we have a rental program. So a 
uh, rent by the day, rent to own, um, which makes it very accessible. Uh, a few dollars a day, you can use it, uh, which is another thing we've put in place. Specific, it doesn't make us any money, frankly, but it, it's a, a thing that we built, spend a lot of time building uh, specifically to get the tool in the hands of people who have smaller budgets, because so many of the folks we we work for and work with uh, do have those smaller budgets. So we're always trying to find ways to to you know get all get all the th- all the things balanced. Yeah, so that we can, yeah. next, next question. And it's from uh, Talalik, Miguel Lopez Waterman in Knoxville, Tennessee. At times, I want to send an NDI feed in with super, super titles so that the super titles operator can be separate from the media server. Is there a way to have a global NDI output that is independent of queues? Hmm. What goes? No, the answer is no. Um, the answer is no. The, uh, the, the structure of QLab, the basic premise of QLab is that cues are what generate material that the audience is going to see or hear. And uh, there's no such thing as something coming out of QLab that doesn't come from a queue. So the queue goes to an output, the output goes to the world. So you could facilitate this by creating an output and routing some cues to that output, then creating a separate output and routing other cues to that output. Um, so I believe that you could, just as we, as someone asked earlier about macros or, or about um, about you know time left for playout, uh, QLab itself doesn't have a facility to do what you're saying, uh, do what you're asking, but you can build yourself a system within QLab to achieve the same end. Next question. Next question from James Chalmers from Glasgow, Scotland. What's the best way to show text cues or prompts remotely to talent on stage? Mm. On stage. Mm. So if it were me, I'd put uh, I'd put a, a monitor somewhere on stage that my talent could see. I would feed that monitor. Uh, hopefully that monitor would have uh, uh, either a native NDI or SDI input. And I'd cable it back to my position wherever my Mac is. If it had a native NDI input, I'd just network it in. If it had a native SDI input, I'd use a black magic card in a Sonnet chassis on my laptop. Um, and uh, I would create a video output for that display and design my um, my talent facing cue material just to the same way that I would design audience facing cue material, except that it would be catered to the needs of that talent monitor. It's just from QLab's perspective, it isn't a special output, it isn't a preview output, it's just an output. And what I send to it is my own business. I think one of the interesting challenges, you know, I do a lot of live events, and but our events are different every time. And so it's really a different thought process than I just, when you were talking about it, I was like, oh, that'd be a lot of work to do for one show. But I realized you're doing the show over and over and over again, or many people are doing these mm-hmm. theater shows over and over again. So you put a ton of effort into the set up and it takes a long time to get that prepped i get to go in you know we plan it but i we load in the day before we do the show and then we leave you know and we'll never do yeah. that again you know like we're, we'll do something maybe similar to it but it'll never be like we don't have we can't but but what we're always looking for is tools that that like qlab allow us to build start build patterns i'm like okay we'll do this 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 and this and we start to understand those and those become kind of templatized and certainly for me, I build up a toolbox of common patterns and I keep them in one QLab workspace that lives in my Dropbox folder. So no matter where mm-hmm. I am in the world, I can pull down that QLab toolbox and have, uh, here's a set of cues that are sort of pre-programmed for this kind of situation. Then I can start there and customize them for the specific application that I'm sitting in front of at the moment. And we, we've also seen folks who do very clever things with scripting where they say, you know, I know I'm, I, need to, I need to do surtitles for an opera or for a, another kind of production. And I'm going to have a text file where one line per in the file per title. And then I'll write a script that kind of sucks in that text file and spits out hundreds of cues that have the, the basic structure of what I need. And then, right. you know, once you have that script written or you have those tools in place, now you're now you're really cooking. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, when do you use the cart display of cues? Uh, when, when do I personally? Uh, I, personally um, I personally envision the cart, uh, the cart display rather than the list display as the appropriate tool whenever I know what I want 
to play back, but I don't know when. Whenever my um, my what is clear, but my my order of events is unclear. I use the list when the what is clear and the when is clear, but the relationship between them in time is not. So in a, in a traditional theatrical comedy, you know, the, the, the better the actors do, the longer the play runs, the, the longer the time between cues because the audience is laughing. So I have a series of events. It's strictly ordered. I know exactly what's coming next, but I wait for the appropriate moment to hit next. In a cart, I'm waiting not only for the appropriate moment to know what's next, but I may not know what is next. I, in improvisational format, uh, if I were playing cues along to this broadcast, I would have a cart available with uh, the eight or 10 most likely things that I want available at my fingertips. A lot of, uh, I see carts used a lot in improv. You know, there's a Chicago theater that does Star Trek improv, and I think they only use carts so they can stick in Star Trek sound effects at just whenever they, whichever ones they need at whatever moment they need, so... That's great. Next question. Mike Burns, Loon Lake, Washington. What's the difference between QLab and VLC? I'm running VLC on my Mac. I think that'd be hard to, I think that might be a whole second hour. <laughs> so so about that, what that looks like, uh, you know, I think that I'll, I'll jump into that. VLC is really a playback system. I mean, it just, it plays back lots of videos from almost anything. It has a couple Q abilities, but it's really just designed to play back videos. I mean, QLab is an entire infrastructure for, queuing and playing and everything else. I think they're, they're pretty, two pretty different worlds as far as, uh, at least how I view VLC. We do see people use in production, in theater production and, and, uh, and in video production, use VLC as a playout system. And I would highly recommend not doing that. Like it's not, that's definitely a Chevette trying to pull a big trailer. Like I said, which it would, it, it would, it's not really what it was built for. Uh, next question. Jonas Dottel from Stuttgart, Germany. Does QLab have an open API to get info like remaining time, current time, etc.? We have a lot of uh, uh, programming programmable interfaces to it. So it supports AppleScript very deeply throughout the program. It also has a ton of OSC uh, access points. So if you're handy with AppleScript or if you're handy with uh, OSC, uh, those are both ways to get a ton of information out of the program. And of course, as we talked about before, you can have QLab proactively be sending information out. So if you build your workspace in a way that it sends information out that you need, uh, and there are ways to do that um, where QLab introspects itself and says, you know, you might have an OSC queue within QLab that says, uh, there's only one queue there, but it Whenever it's run, it says, go get the name of, of the current, the, the most recent running queue and send that out. So that's only one queue that then changes itself every time it runs to send out the particular piece of information that you're interested in. And by the way, if, if you want to save time on the, the hyperdeck thing that we talked about earlier, Jonas already builds one called Playout B <laughs> that, that, that is already there. So he, uh, uh, he, he knows a lot about, oh, about that process. So um, anyway, uh, next question. Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada. Ask, how much has the community around QLab influenced its success? And how did you foster the community? I think it's been huge. I mean, I think it's been maybe the number number one thing. Um, it's it's sort of hard to overstate how, how big a deal the community is. We have uh, a Google group of everywhere from uh, high school students who are, who are starting out uh, to Tony, multi-Tony award-winning designers who are active, like active participants, uh, helping other people on the list. Um, and it's in terms of fostering, I think, I think we just come at it from a position of gratitude and respect and, and try to support what people are doing, um, and make space for it. And, um, uh, and, you know, listen and listen very carefully to what people are telling us about what they want, what they want changed, what isn't working for them, and try to respond to that as best as best we can. Um, the more the more the program gets used, the harder that gets. <laughs> uh, the more people in the world who are using it, the harder it, it becomes. But we continue to try to do our best. That's great. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, what niche do you see for QLab's lighting features versus dedicated desktop lighting control platforms like the ETC Nomad? That's a really good question. Um, for us, the um, uh, the functionality of QLab's lighting uh, powers right now, I feel roughly matches an ETC Express. And a person who's uh, interested in using a console at that level of complexity 
is in a pickle because I feel those consoles are hard. The Express is no longer for sale. So if you want a console of that, about that power, you either have to find something used and spend $4,500 on a 10 year old used Express, or you can use QLab. Um, also, if you have a physically constrained control booth, uh, QLab is great uh, compared to an Express, which takes up a lot of space. If you're using Nomad, if you're controlling elaborate moving light setups, um, QLab can be a little quicker to use than Nomad, in my opinion, um, although it does not have all the same uh, sort of high-end power. So our feeling is that QLab's lighting features are still in their younger days, and we are continuing to develop them. Someone asked earlier, what's next for QLab? And while I can't say that lighting development is literally next, I can say that lighting development is constantly towards the top of our list, and we are um, continuing to explore what we can do with it. Right now, I use QLab's lighting um, for house light control, which seems trivial, but actually is really nice when your house lights are queued right into the rest of your system. And I use it to um, control parameters on video projectors, which prefer DMX control. There are several out there, Barco notably, has a good DMX library. And so to be able to just run my shutter on the projector from QLab rather than having to get the lighting department involved uh, is really convenient for me. Smaller touring shows really like the lighting features because a, you know, a one person show can just have everything built into one workspace. They take it from venue to venue and and they don't have to lean on whatever hardware might be at that particular venue. So yeah, there are, there are, um, there are niches where it's, it's a real, it's a real helpful tool, and then we're just going to keep keep working on it. Sam and Chris, thank you so much for your time. Oh, pleasure! It's always such a pleasure to have you guys on. We're just so excited yeah. about what you guys work on, what you're thank working you so, on. So thank you so us. much. Delighted to be here. I got to go play with the linear key. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I realized I've been since five O came out. I've just been really in deep production and haven't been able to get take a breath. And I was like, oh, I got to get out there, and I just got to download. You know, you know, get 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 dig, digging into it. So, um, really excited about that, and we're really excited about the theater. So, um, you know, it would be really interesting to see what what kind of streaming we could get out of there. So, we should talk oh, about that. Boy. Yeah, let's uh, do. Do you, do you have bandwidth there? A good, um, good bandwidth? we we. Our next step up in bandwidth is a huge step up in cost. Baltimore has really limited fiber options. Yeah. Um, to, you can now finally get fiber, but it's it's extraordinarily expensive. So we probably need to go there. What we have now is is fine for the shows that we've been doing. Um, you know, it's right. fine. It's it's Comcast's highest end, but then it's like, oh, it's also Comcast. So right, 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 right. you you know you get what you get. Um, right. But we we can we can bump it up when we're ready to really try to go for it. Sounds great. No. Very cool. We'll talk more about yeah. that. Okay, cool. All right. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Sam. And thanks Thank to you. thanks to all the producers who uh, asked all the great questions, kept this all going. Um, so really, really great questions. Thanks, thank you to the panelists. Can't do this without you. And uh, thanks to the incredible team every day that get, that comes together, <laughs> figures out how to run this show, uh, um, you know, uh, from all over the world. So, uh, so thank you all for your work. We appreciate you. All right. Let's go ahead and jump into After Hours. This is the quiet place where we all just whisper. They, they really wanted to get those credits up because they came up a couple times during the show. <laughs> That's good. Thanks to Chris and, uh, and Sam. This was really great. Yeah, it's awesome. Oh, such a pleasure. Thank you for having so much. Us. Such a good place to learn. So I know we talked about it before, but we haven't done enough of them. So QLab Labs. We all just play with it all right well we'll think about that we're gonna try to do a, an in-person version of that here we're gonna do uh one night a month that we just have open doors at the theater and yeah we have to stream it that would be awesome yeah we gotta, it, it's you know you're, you don't want to be constrained by time and space <laughs> <laughs> we just uh, to at the voxel that has to happen yes okay we'll, we'll talk more about that we'll make a plan bye all right bye bye everyone <laughs>